Divorce TV with Wally Marcus and Mary Marcus. Topic today, divorce co-mediation. Support for Divorce TV provided in part by the Center for Divorce Mediation, 577-1202. Hi, I'm Wally Marcus and I'm your host for Divorce TV and our topic today is co-mediation. And we have a special co-host today who is my also partner and co-mediator, Mary Marcus, Dr. Mary Marcus. And we're going to be uh, talking a little bit today about a topic that we've worked on for very years. So it's sort of a, a unique thing to do. Um, I've been mediating for many, many years, and uh, you've heard my, my spiel a lot of times. But Mary, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I am a clinical psychologist uh, by training before I became a mediator, and I've been mediating since 1994, a lot of it co-mediation with you. And some of it solo mediation because clients sometimes prefer co-mediation, sometimes they prefer one mediator. And before I forget, and I tend to do that a little bit here, if you want more information about the show, you'll see our website at the bottom of the screen periodically, so you can, you can check that out on that one. Uh, we do the mediation, as well, I think we, after a while we sort of take it for granted what mediation really is, and a lot of, I know we get phone calls from clients and people periodically, and they really don't understand what mediation is at all, and, you know, and they'll, even after you sometimes explain it to them. And I see it sort of as a problem-solving process, and I think you think about it the same way I do on it, but what's your, what's your take on it? Yeah, I think that people come to us because they have a dispute, and we look at that dispute as a problem to be solved as opposed to a negotiation. I think I know you have somewhat strong feelings on this and what co-mediation is and what uh, it isn't and what the roles are. Um, you know, I'm an attorney by training. You're a clinical psychologist by training, and I think people sometimes have different expectations because of that. What's your What's your sense on? Uh... Well, I think co-mediation is a mediation process in which you have two mediators, as opposed to just one, helping the parties resolve their dispute. And how about shuttling back and forth? You like that? No, <laughs> uh, I think that's one of the things that co-mediation isn't to me. But in co-mediation, you have two mediators who oftentimes uh, are different genders because it provides for the kind of diversity that parties often find helpful. Also, two heads are always better than one if you're trying to solve a problem. And one of the nice things about having two mediators in the room is that one of the mediators can be focused on the process while the other person's focused on content. And so you collect a lot more information that I way. I always think when we sort of talk about two heads are better than one, actually I think there's more than just two heads. I think by the time you have two people because of the synergy in the process, you end up actually having three heads. Yeah, I um, think that's one way of looking at it. And I, I know, think... No, over the years I know that we sort of, you'll say something and it'll sort of get me, prompt me to think of something I wouldn't have thought of otherwise, otherwise too. Right, and you were asking what co-mediation isn't. And I think what co-mediation isn't is that... It isn't a process in which one mediator is an advocate for one of the parties and the other mediator is an advocate for the other party. And people sometimes assume that's what's going to happen in co-mediation. And that definitely is not the way it works. But it seems to me in years that we've been mediating, co-mediating, that there are times when we sort of sort of play off of each other a little bit or sometimes even when you, I don't know, do you think it that way when we've done it in a case where somebody needs a little bit more support and then sometimes you can... Sort of provide. I mean, it's, a, it's a very delicate, obviously a very delicate balance, and one that's hard to, to do. Yeah. But occasionally, you, you do a slight aligning sometimes with one of the people, I, and I, fi I find that periodically when we're doing, particularly because of the gender issues, that uh, sometimes the husband will feel uh, sort of associate with me, and the wife will associate with you. Sometimes, but I think it's no different than in an ordinary mediation where you have one mediator, where a mediator at times is aligning themselves with one of the parties in order to achieve some kind of breakthrough in the mediation and to give support to one person uh, momentarily. We never continue to ally ourselves with one person because the other person would then feel, what are they there for? Uh, the mediator's biased and, you know, we don't want to be biased as mediators. I think one of the things I've always found amusing when we do the co-mediation is, is that because I'm an attorney, the people sort of look to me on, on those kind of questions and look to you on the other questions. And I think the, one of my, my funniest recollections on that was when we were sitting there doing something and I'll, you'll, we'll do something. I said, you'll say, what about capital gains? And they're, they're, like, they're surprised that you're asking that question. Yeah, well, I think early on in 
uh, mediation history, co-mediation was done that way, where there were uh, rules about which mediator would handle which issues, that the therapist mediator would handle parenting issues, and the attorney mediator would handle the financials. And I think the advantage of not doing it that way is that clients um, aren't stuck in stereotypes and often what we found, you know, is that uh, we try to help clients get beyond the fact that the mother may be the uh, primary parent and give opportunities for the father who may not have as many experiences parenting to parent. And so that's why you'll go against stereotype by saying, oh. Got to go uh, and make dinner. Yeah, My turn to make exactly. Dinner tonight. I Which pick can up be the very kids. effective in getting people out of ruts. Yeah, it does it that way too. I mean, I think it's interesting. I, I, you sometimes, sometimes refer to us as the dynamic duos, but you never told me who's Batman and who's Robin on this one. So I'm not sure on that one. But I, I think that you know, clearly we're mixing the, the, the uh, different professionals of origin, the attorney, we've talked a little bit about that. What about, you know, in the gender balance thing, we a little bit too, too, but I think the husband, wife, the uh, father, mother ends up being a very uh, useful thing, and I think a lot of people like that. And we're sort of unusual in what we do when we do that. Yeah, but I can envision situations where you uh, have two mediators who may be the same gender, but who bring other kinds of diversity to the situation. Someone who may be the same um, uh, language speaker as one of the parties and uh, you know the parties may feel that there's a nice balance that uh, you have a person who uh, understands their you know native language and or their native culture uh, and so that can create a different kind of balance that's helpful to clients. I think I always like when we sort of talk about it when I, I talk to people about uh, the mediation and they call us on the telephone, I will often say that, you know, you we can use Mary, you can use me, you can use both of us, and you like the potential using both of us because there is that gender balance in terms of that, and if there's one male mediator and a husband, sometimes the wife will feel ganged up and vice versa, and that way you end up with a, a more comfortable process. I think the results tend to be very much the same no matter which way we do it, but I think that it's the comfort level for the uh, for the clients which makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I agree, and, and that is the goal, uh, I think, to make the clients comfortable enough and safe enough that they can discuss some potential solutions to their dispute. Um, it seems to me, you mentioned it earlier, and I, I think that's very critical. And once again, I'm looking back at cases that we've handled in the process content question, and I, I still always remember the case that we handled in which I was on a roll, the husband was saying um, that we were on the financial, and probably, and then all of a sudden the wife, and I think there's been a situation where the husband may have had an affair, it was a trust issue, and the wife said, you know, but I trust him on financial issues. And, and sometimes trust, you have trust in some areas and not in other areas, and I thought it was interesting at that point because you sort of, and that was the nice process content, I was involved in the, the process a little bit and getting wrapped up in it, you were in the content, I don't know, do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, I remember that, and I think that happens on occasion that one person who's mediating is... Uh, you know, stuck with their eyes on uh, the financials, for example, and you miss a lot of the body language, which is so crucial to resolving uh, some of these cases, especially the difficult ones. I know. I, I feel like over the years, I've picked up a lot of psychology. You know, maybe my my PhD is mm -hmm. in small letters, but uh, you know, I, and I seem I got the sense too that you picked up, uh, you know, a lot of law also. Well, Are you I, ready to take the bar exam? No. Um, <laughs> But I think, you know, to be a good mediator, you need all those skills. And any person who's a mediator, whether their profession of origin is law or their profession of origin is accounting or it's uh, a mental health, has to also know what all those other pieces that go into the particular case that they're dealing with, if it's a divorce or if it's uh, an employment case or uh, a real estate case, you really do need to know the different pieces. I think very often I feel like we're sort of modeling behavior. Um, for that. Yeah, I think we can often model disagreement. We've done that, and sometimes intentionally, sometimes <laughs> not intentionally. But um, I think that that can be very helpful to clients to show them that it's safe to disagree and how to assert themselves in a way that's helpful as opposed to the kind of 
non-productive rut that they've gotten into and that's brought them to our office. Yeah, I always say, kid, we can argue in mediation and get paid for it. Yeah, How many exactly. people can get paid for, for, for doing that one? Um, I don't know. What's your sense? I mean, I, I, it seems to me that people sometimes self-select for the for the mediation of who picks me, who picks co-mediation, who doesn't. I know cost for some people is a factor. We'll discuss a little bit yeah. later on. But I, I think some people have said to to us that uh, their spouse won't listen to a male or they won't listen to a female, and that may lead them to choose co-mediation where you have the gender balance. But I think also some people se- select co-mediation because there is a mental health person in the room and sometimes they are under the misimpression that we're going to be providing therapy, which we don't. But um, I think there's a hope that somehow having someone with that mental health background will make the mediation go more smoothly because they will understand where the parties may be coming from, especially uh, people who do have some mental health problems. I've got to admit to you, I think that on some of these issues that I mean, on the parenting issues, uh, I, you know, I think you have a little bit better sense on that one. No matter, I mean, I, as much as I've absorbed by osmosis of things like that, I think I still feel I've always felt that you have a, you know, and, and I don't know if you feel like I have a slight edge on the well, on the legal stuff or not. I, but. Well, I, but I think that we don't give people parenting advice. Uh, we don't give people advice at all in mediation. That's a good point. And, we should, and you know, so, I think it's a misunderstanding so, in mediation. That people expect, you know, tell me what right. my rights and are. Right, and so we have an understanding of when someone may need a referral out to a child psychologist, for example, if there's a parenting issue. Um, and I think that th- that may be the advantage that um, a mental health mediator may have is you know when it's time to send people for additional help. And I think that's true for some of the legal stuff also, that you may know that there's a particular type of attorney that these people ought to see uh, to help them reach uh, some kind of resolution to a particular problem, you know, whether they need to see uh, an elder uh, care attorney or they need uh, an attorney to help with... um, Real estate matters, or whatever. You know, one of the other benefits I was thinking that I, I think with the with the co-mediation that I've always liked is that that you have somebody to talk to, and I think you know on a, on a lot of different levels. But certainly, the, you know, I think that the, it's sometimes out of the mediation sessions where you and I will talk about something, where we'll get some ideas or something that you wouldn't have gotten. In it. And for me, I've always the synergy of talking about things has always yeah. made me more creative. I, I think that's true, and also I think it's really good for the clients, as you said, because we can come up with things that um, we might not otherwise come up with. And I think also we preserve the confidentiality of mediation. I mean, mediation is a very lonely profession in some sense because everything is confidential that's said in mediation. And so you can't run to a colleague and say, you know, uh, what do you think? Um, I think, you know, I'm talking about we do the co-mediation, and it's easy for us to do that because we've been doing it. And as I say, I think I've heard you say a lot of times you can complete my sentences, um, where, you know, co-mediation that we sometimes do on a volunteer basis, um, the attorney general's office, or I do it uh, our family, where you're dealing with somebody you haven't worked out with before. But, I, I, you know, I think you still have to share the sort of the same vision. And Well, I think uh, it's a little bit like a dance. And if you have We're not going to get up and dance, are we? No. <laughs> and if you haven't danced with that person, you can't anticipate their movements. And I think that's what becomes awkward sometimes in mediating with someone you've never mediated before, which is that, you know, people have a tendency oftentimes to defer to the other person, and it ends up being not as productive as working with co-mediators who have worked together before who have a particular approach that has been honed over many years. Yeah, I guess I think this has a distinct advantage. But I think also there's a a question of whether you respect each other and uh, you not underutilize each other. And once again, I think when the the mediators have worked together, well, that's probably a good question for people to ask if you're going to co-mediation, what's the experience of the of the people working with the other other media. I haven't thought about that until this instant, but really, you know, you could spend a, a lot of time, a client could spend a lot of time with mediators who don't know what they're doing. And money. And, and money um, doing that, and it would really, I, you know, I don't think it's a good idea for the client to be paying for the co-mediators to learn how to co-mediate. Right, I think you're right. When, um, anything else that you're thinking about advantages in co- of infective co-mediation? Well, I think that the advantage is, is truly that uh, you have... Uh, 
more people working to solve the problem and more people generally are more creative uh, and can come up with solutions that uh, not you know everybody might have already been able to to think of um, and and it does provide that level of safety and comfort I think that allows the parties also to be creative and to take chances uh, on solutions they might not otherwise have felt comfortable trying. Now, going back to what we were sort of saying before, I realize when we, sometimes when we co-mediate that uh, we can sort of debrief, not only part of the debriefing afterwards is saying you can, it's almost like a training process. And I think, you know, that, you know, you know, why did you say that, Wally? Or why did you say that, Mary? Where were you going with that? And I, so, so I think we sort of always, you know, sort of perfect our, our, our techniques by, you know, doing that. And if, yeah. And I think we did more of that in the early stages of co-mediating um, and, and do less of that now, which, uh, you know, doesn't mean that it's not a very valuable uh, tool uh, because occasionally we will do things that surprise the other person. Well, I so, think that that happens periodically. Matter that you raise an interesting point, which is, I think, the table arrangement of co-mediation. And, and you and I have the style where we face each other, and then there's, there's two two schools of thought on how you should sit at, uh, at a mediation, whether yeah. the mediators should sit next to each other and uh, with the disputants on their side, like you and like yeah. you and I are now with the disputants sitting here and here, or you and I at a round table. Well, what concerns me about sitting next to the d disputant is that there is the, the appearance of allying with the person you're sitting next to. And I, I think that since people come in with that perception sometimes, what you're doing is you're reinforcing it by something as simple as a seating arrangement. Um, you know, it, when we're looking at each other and sitting across from the table, and ideally at a round table so that um, we're not sitting alongside, you know, either party, I think that gives them the sense that we are not, in fact, uh, an advocate for either of them. And it also allows us to make eye contact, and when one of us is going in some direction <laughs> the other person doesn't agree to, we can roll our eyes at each yes, other. Yes, you do that. Well, you do a little bit sometimes more of rolling your <laughs> eyes uh, on that situation. I, I, I find uh, I'm doing that. And it sort of raises the interesting question of signaling each other on how you do that. I mean, kicking under the table is, is, is one way of doing it, but I think that you know, we can sometimes pick up on the tones and other things and... Uh, do that. And one of the things I always thought was interesting in the co-mediation is that you can sort of say, well, you know, I really want to, you know, and I know that because occasionally I'll go off in a different direction, you know, it's like, or you'll be finished and I want to go someplace and I'll say, do, you know, do you mind if I can do that? And it serves two functions, it seems to me. One is that we, you know, are, you know, show modeling the behavior again that you can easily do that and uh, the other ones you can't. Yeah, and I think it it's good when you kind of say, I, I don't know where you're going, because it allows yeah. the clients also to say to each other, I don't know where you're going. And in a non-critical kind of way, but in uh, a curious way. Although I always loved, there was a TV show, I think with Martin Mull, it was a guy years ago, and, but it was, it was, co, was co-therapy instead of co-mediation. And in the first series, I always loved that scene where he, the, 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 the co-mediators walk out or the co-therapist walk out and the couple walks out and the co-therapists are arguing. You think they're the couple right. that's in for therapy and because of the, the nature of that as opposed yeah. to the other one. It was just a, one of those funny uh, things that I always think of in that situation um, on that one. Um, the, uh, talk a little bit about cost on here. It seems to be cost and other process. Well, I, I think cost is the, the primary reason that people don't choose co-mediation because it's a little bit more expensive, but you and I know that most people can't afford to pay the full cost of having two mediators in the room with them, and therefore we've structured our fees so that it's a little bit more expensive, but it's nowhere near double. And uh, so that becomes uh, something that's much more affordable. And again, if it leads to a quicker resolution to uh, the dispute, whether it's a divorce or some other kind of dispute, it is cost effective for people. I think it's hard to explain that because people still think two is more expensive than one, but I think you're right, the efficiency factor. And I think one of the other factors that I, I think is important is the question of uh, post-judgment issues. And I, I, I've always found the co-mediation a much more comprehensive 
process. Because I think you said the two heads are better than one. You do that. So I think there's a, a likelihood there's going to be less post-judgment issues in a coma. I would suspect. I don't know. We did this yeah, study years ago. I'm not I, sure we've ever no. analyzed that uh, on doing that one. But uh, it's possible. Um, but I do think that uh, it's just quicker getting to uh, resolution because you do have two people in there. Um, and although one of the things that you know we explain to couples at that point too is that you know when we're drafting, when we draft the documents, you're only paying for one mediator, you're not paying for two. So it's really only the in sessions you know that you're getting paid a, a little bit more. And I, you know I, I always thought it was is not significantly more than uh, than uh, you know sort of a double. I think it's good. It's a good value, but it, you're right, right. A lot of people are. Uh, well, and I think it's a novel concept. I think uh, most mediators in uh, divorce cases in Tucson are solo mediators. Uh, I don't know that they're... I don't think, yeah, you're right. I don't uh, think there are any other co-mediators. And, and so it's, it's just a model that's a little uh, unusual for a lot of clients, and it requires a little bit of explaining why anyone should consider mediation. Well, as, you, as you were saying, I was thinking, you know, I used to watch people that were doing... A, mediation and it'd be two women, two men. What, I mean, I, I just never felt that was, you know, you were losing a lot of the benefits of the husband, wife, the mother, the father, the, you know, the gender additions I'm doing. Well, that perha- but perhaps those people bring some other diversity to the, the situation and, uh, and you certainly have the two heads, you know, are better than one uh, scenario, regardless of whether there's gender balance or not. I also think one of the things, you know, I know I'm jumping around too much again, but it, was, it occurred to me that uh, that that it's it's harder to co-opt one of the mediators when you uh, have two of the one. Maybe. I mean, so? I think if you have a good solo mediator, they still are not going to allow themselves to be co-opted. But I think oftentimes uh, people in co-mediation may expect that they would uh, have an ability to ally themselves with one person. And we've certainly seen couples where people try to do that. They may think that if they demean, you know, one of the mediators, the other mediator will somehow be on their side. <laughs> exactly. But uh, pe- people sometimes try that. Um, and uh, I think the other misconception about co-mediation may be that people think that the mediators use a sort of good cop, bad cop approach. And, and we don't do that. Um, because, again, the goal is to get people to try something they may not have been willing to consider, not to, to browbeat them into, tr- into something. Yeah. Because right. that's not going to hold up over time, and so there's no value to that. You know, we've talked a lot about uh, the advantages of co-mediation, but I suspect that there must be some, you know, do you see disadvantages at all? In, uh... I think just primarily the cost. Um, no, no, I've thought some other things, too. I mean, I guess less with you and I, but I think sometimes I certainly, when I've co-mediated in situations other than you and I, um, where there's the mediators don't get along, I mean, I certainly heard stories from our yeah. colleagues where there's a conflict or competition or something like that with... Uh, right, I think that would be a, a potential big problem, but again, as you suggested, clients should ask whether... Uh, the co-mediators have actually worked together and how long because you don't want to be the first uh, <laughs> couple that somebody's uh, co-mediating with because there is just uh, sort of a getting up to speed process for mediators like anybody else. And also I think that it can be in fact more expensive if you have the mediators who are spending a lot of time um, a lot of times trying to work their own, out of their own issues. As yeah. a matter of fact, I was doing a co-mediation out with you with somebody else and you know the, the caucus process. Normally, we say to the clients, "If you want to caucus, you can caucus." Um, which a caucus means, you know, sitting with one of the parties not in, and the other one out. And I wanted to caucus with the, with my co-mediator because we were just, you know, yeah. at odds. But you bring up another good point uh, about co-mediation and what it's not, which is that when we caucus, we don't caucus separately uh, because that leads again to the good cop, bad cop potential scenario where. Uh, the parties feel that uh, one mediator's on their side and the other mediator's on the other person's side, and I don't think that's terribly productive. And uh, so when we caucus, we're both sitting with one of the parties, and then we shift to sitting with the other party. 
a lot of you know some of the, from the literature says about a divide and conquer sort of strategy with clients. But I don't, I don't I really haven't experienced. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe I'm trying to think of a situation where the divide. You think so? It's not an approach that I really favor. Although there's some. I mean, not us, not with the the couples, but I mean, to the, where the one of the parties is. Oh, uh, I, but that that happens in any kind of mediation where parties may try to ally themselves, and that's the test of a good mediator. Whether the good mediator is aware of that and can't avoid getting caught up in it. I think you know, one of the other perceived disadvantages with co-mediation is sometimes that you might be stepping on the other co-mediator's toes and you, one of the mediators wouldn't be assertive again. But once again, that's not something I've found in working with us because we, you know, we sort of communicate those things and do it well. But I guess inexperienced co-mediators might have that be a sort of timidity. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that an inexperienced set of co-mediators may want to do is to meet before they meet with the clients to lay out uh, what the dance steps, so to speak, are going to be. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think that you know, we sort of do that. I mean, I was driving to the mediation, which is a nice factor, is that we'll be sort of sometimes discussing, you know, what are we going to do today, how we're going to approach the problem. And I don't know how you find with your individual mediation. I think I suspect that you end up doing that anyway. I, I tend to be a little bit more seat of the pants and, and not as much. So it works well for me because it gives me somebody to sort of talk about it and bounce ideas off of. Yeah. And, and very often I think I, what I will also do at this point is I'll say, what do you think if I say this or do that? And we'll be able to discuss that, and that may stimulate you to... Uh... Well, I think that's the advantage of mediation, that mediators are conscious of what their behavior needs to be in order to get the parties to resolution. But you need to have some strategy. You don't just go in there and sit uh, and react. Uh, and it wouldn't be fair to ask clients to pay for that either. So we generally do have a strategy, and with co-mediation, it's, it's important to have a strategy as well. Believe it or not, we're running out of time. So my guests always say, you know, that uh, I can't believe it went went that quickly on that one. But this has been sort of fun to do this time. Uh, we are running out of time um, on doing that. I, I, I always, every time we talk, I learn something a little bit more about uh, the whole process. But you've been watching Divorce TV with Wally Marcus and Mary Marcus today. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the show and learned a little bit about co-mediation. And uh, we'll continue to watch our future shows. And if you want to watch any of our future shows, go to our website and you'll see our, uh, our, our website, which tells you where you can watch us on YouTube, which is at uh, youtube dash divorce tv backslash tv divorce tv. So thank you very much for watching the show and um, look forward to seeing you with the next show.